Hello, Watch Enthusiasts. Now, Baselworld has now been going for a few days, and the releases there, I think, have been extremely interesting, and in many ways more interesting than previous years, because the, the whole dynamic of the show has been different since the leaving of, of the, the Swatch group. And so it has been a show with a few releases which have turned heads, a few releases which have, have shocked to a certain degree, and a few which have been unanimously uh, appreciated and well-received. And so in this, this first video of the four videos I'm going to make on Baselworld, I'd like to talk about the tool watches and the dive watches which have been released, which always are a major part of the show, although this year I feel are less of a major part, with a much more even um, array of watches released by a number of brands. And certainly there have been some very interesting pieces which I think, unfortunately, in other years wouldn't have received quite the appreciation which they have this year. And so it's, it certainly is an interesting show. And before I begin this video on the highlights of this particular segment of the market, do like, share and subscribe if you enjoy the video and would like to see more content here in future. Also, do follow me on Instagram at the, uh, the account name which is now on the screen to be able to, to see more coverage of uh, a variety of elements of the watch industry which otherwise wouldn't be featured here on the channel. Also, I would of course like to note that I am selling two watches for my personal collection, my Seiko Marine Master SBDX017, which is one year old, and it was produced in the last weeks of production of the final Marine Master 300, um, of, with that full designation on the dial, which I find rather interesting. It's in very good condition, with an unused bracelet and strap, and the price is around £2,000, though do email me if you're interested. And that also applies to my Zin 104 STSAIW, which is the white dial version of the Zin, with the Zin 104. And as waiting lists for these watches extend into the months, it's a nice time to be able to pick one up, and so I'm selling mine, which is two years old, has been serviced by an authorised Zin dealer, and of course is, um, is running in, in full working order in very good condition as well. So do drop me an email at the address down below if you're, if you're interested in either of these purchases. The Zin is £950. Now, the first piece which I should speak about, and one which I think is unavoidable in a video like this, is the new Rolex Seedweller. Now, this is a watch which I debated speaking about first, but I feel ought to be spoken about first because it sets the tone, I feel, for the direction of this Basel world. And just as a hint, it's not a negative tone in terms of the general releases. And just to speak over the general specifications of the watch first, before speaking about my opinions and, and what I think of it in the general line of Rolex, this piece is exactly the same as the standard red text Sea Dweller. So it's a 43mm by 15mm thick watch, except now it's not presented just in what they call oyster steel, which is essentially 904L. They now have yellow gold in there as well for the mid links, as well as the bezel and the crown, as well as the various details on the dial and the Sea Dweller text being included in gold. And this is yellow gold and so does give this, um, this rather lustrous look, an almost 1980s look to this timepiece. It also retains the standard water resistance of the piece, which is 1,220 metres, or 4,000 feet, and also has the same off-colour text on the dial, although of course now is in gold. Of course it retains the ceramic bezel of previous versions, but now is filled with yellow gold, rather than simply having the, the standard coloration for the markers, and also it does feature the same style of bracelet with glide lock and flip lock to, to make it more usable for a diver. Then of course one has a helium escape valve, and inside the Kelber 3235, which when released was the start of the new line of Rolex movements for their three-hand watches, and I must admit I think ought to have been put in the Submariner by this year, but still hasn't been, uh, been done. And so it has a 70-hour power reserve, it does run the standard plus two minus two regulation that Rolex have, and runs at four hertz with 31 joules, with the, the Chrono G escapement which allows a, um, a, a newer and better style of escapement for these watches. But I think having moved the specifications out of the way, it's important to note really why this watch is perhaps not as sacrilegious as it first appears, but still why I must admit I find it um, rather a grotesque uh, move for Rolex for the Sea Dweller as a design. Now to understand why in some ways this watch does make sense in its two-tone setup, one has to look back at the watches produced by Rolex for the absolute deep sea missions of the Bathyscaf Trieste in the 1950s and 60s. Because during that period there was a, a great deal of, of push to explore the seas, and that particular submersible was able to uh, to descend to the full depth of the Challenger's Deep, which is known to be the, um, the, 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 the deepest part of the ocean, at least, that we're aware of. And of course Rolex strapped their deep sea special to the outside of that, um, that submersible, and then produced a, uh, a certain amount of models in two-tone gold to commemorate this dive, though of course the one that went down with the Bathyscaph was all steel. And so some people have said that's an argument for Rolex uh, to offer this watch in this particular setup. However, I feel that uh, this is somewhat, um, uh, somewhat of an overstatement of really the historical background to this watch, because it is undeniable that the, the Sea Dweller was designed to be a professional diver's watch, and not to have any luxury connotations whatsoever. 
And so as a result, I can't help but feel this is more of a, a sales exercise than anything else, to be able to sell more of these pieces with this two-tone setup, and to make the Sea Dweller a means of wearing a larger gold sports Rolex, rather than being something which is ideologically very different to the Submariner. And so as a result, I feel this watch is a somewhat unfortunate uh, manoeuvre for Rolex with this particular product line, and I don't know what the, the reception of this watch will be like from uh, from others, indeed buyers, but I must admit I do find that it's, it's an unfortunate change in the line of the Sea Dweller, and it's very meaning in the Rolex collection as a whole. So I think it would have been nice to see something more innovative from Rolex, rather than simply producing a, a two-tone gold version of the Sea Dweller. Now the second watch from the Hans Wildorf Foundation, which has really turned heads, has been the Tudor Black Bay P01. And this piece is based on the 1967 piece, which was made in four examples for the US Navy as prototypes. And these watches were designed to be extremely resilient and robust, and to have a high watch resistance. So they were based, in terms of their case, on the Tudor Submariner, but given this crown at the 4 o'clock position, given this unique bezel, which was luminous, by the way, on the original, and this setup where one had these, these end links, which acted as a bezel locking system. And on, the, on this version, both of them uh, worked to be able to, to make the bezel not move, and of course the bezel was graduated with these 12 hours, much like the Ben, uh, ben Roos dive watches produced for the US Navy as well. And so one can see a lineage of watches in this military style. And so this year, Tudor have chosen to remake this piece in a, a more modern version. Now this is a piece which very few people could quite believe when it was first released a few days ago, because really this isn't the sort of material which Tudor normally would uh, would produce, because Tudor is recognised as a rather conservative brand in terms of their designs, and not a brand keen to um, to, to, to place a large uh, bet on a design which is, to say the, the very least, uh, an acquired taste. And so the modern version is stainless steel of course, and it rounds off some of the edges seen on the original prototype, and really refines the design somewhat with a sunburst style bezel, as well as a, a more fine style of lug, and a crown which appears much more defined and much more refined as well. One also has this, this rather peculiar design where the whole case is brushed, but one has these end links, and on the modern version only the top end link rotates on its, on its pivot to be able to allow the, the bezel to be released and locked. And one aspect which I would have appreciated changed would be to have loom on the bezel, which was seen on the original, but hasn't been chosen to be put on this adventure-style watch on the new version. Now the end links on this watch are non-removable, and so the actual lugs which attach to the leather strap which this watch comes with are these, these separate pieces which are hinged, and this means that the top lug can rotate to be able to allow the bezel to turn in a bi-directional motion, or be, uh, be locked. And I think this is a clever design and something which, which is just so different to anything else on the market, it, it's very interesting to see. One also has typical black bay cues with the case increased to 42mm in diameter, and of course the dial having that matte black style, although unlike other black bays, the dial is actually printed rather than having applied markers to give a more military and more, more robust sort of look to this watch, a more rudimentary look in many ways as well. The date is also included, like the black bay steel, and it has 200m 660 feet in red on the dial just due to draw the eye, which wasn't seen on the original, but which I think is a nice touch. Now, the price for this watch is 3,750 Swiss francs, which I think is, is a reasonable price, bearing in mind that it's, it's just under the Pelagos, as in pounds this is 2,830. So I think they've, they've priced it very reasonably, and inside this watch they do have one of their newer line of movements, being the MT5612, which is the movement we recognise to see in, the, in, in versions um, such as the Pelagos, for instance, which is automatic in-house with a 70-hour power reserve, a silicon hairspring, and a free-sprung weighted balance. So one does get a great deal in the way of specifications with this piece too. And of course it's going to be divisive because a lot of people were expecting, or rather hoping, for a, a return of the style um, of the, uh, the, the, the Tudor Submariner. And the Tudor Submariner I don't think would have been a possibility, at least with the Mercedes hands, I think the chances would be very unlikely, because I really doubt that Rolex would allow Tudor to, to use this design, and certainly wouldn't allow them to use the brand name of, uh, of the Submariner on their own watch. But I think whilst this is an unexpected piece, and certainly won't sell in large numbers, I'm certain, I think it's a very interesting model, and one which uh, which does uh, does raise a few questions about what, what is acceptable and what isn't acceptable where an exotic design goes. Now another watch I'm incredibly enthusiastic about, and in many ways more enthusiastic about it than the Tudor, because the Tudor will have a limited appeal, whereas I think this won't, is the Zodiac Aerospace GMT. And this is a remake of the original style of Zodiac uh, Aerospace, which was released in the 1950s and, and run through the 60s as well, which used a similar 35mm case to the Seawolf, but, um, but had that GMT function and the wonderful uh, translucent Bakelite bezel. And this remake rises to 40mm, although these Zodiacs tend to be a little bit slimmer at the case with an overhanging bezel, and it's 13mm thick. 
Inside the watch, to be able to power the GMT function of this watch, it uses the ETA2893-2, running at 4 hertz with 21 joules, a, a GMT function, and of course the date. But the design of this watch is, is very much original, and I appreciate this because Zodiac released their original watch, not as a derivative uh, stab at the Rolex, uh, the Rolex uh, GMT Master, but rather as their own timepiece. And we'll also see a, re a rethink of the design of this case, which is different to, for example, the Seawolf cases, because it has brushing on the top of the lugs, um, and also bevels running along the edge of those, those lugs, which, which I think add shape to them, and do make this watch a more complex and more interesting piece to look at. The bracelet also has this style of, of riveted shape, which I think goes very well with the look of the watch, but I like the fact that Zodiac have made this watch a bit more playful with the coloration. And because aside from this watch's sapphire crystal, which is this box shape, one also has this, this very shapely mineral crystal bezel, I appreciate the fact they've used this to, to increase the, the coloration of this watch. So despite it being quite a serious 200 meter water resistant watch, it has a great deal of coloration with the gulf livery style colours of blue and orange on the bezel, with matching work on the GMT hand, or a grey and black setup for a more subdued look. And so I think either way this is a very appealing watch, and it will be released in 182 versions, or pieces rather, um, of each uh, each version, with these two versions available. And they're selling out very quickly, but uh, the price is 1,695 US dollars. Now the next piece I'd like to speak about is also a recreation of a vintage piece, except in this case it's much more originally correct to the, the original piece. And this is the Seiko 1970s Prospects Divers Recreation, which is the SLA-033, or if you want to use the old Seiko nomenclature, is the SBDX-031. And this is essentially a replica of the, the 6105-8110, which was very famously the watch worn in Apocalypse Now, but was a piece which still holds on to a great deal of recognition as one of Seiko's um, most popular dive watches, with that asymmetrical case with the crown which, uh, which is guarded by that, um, that heavily accentuated cushion case, and of course with the bezel style which, uh, which really defined later Seiko. And in fact, one sees a great deal of trickle-down from this watch into the SKX and Turtle lines one has today. And I think it's unsurprising that Seiko have released this piece, bearing in mind the fact that last year they released a remake of their 6159, and the year before that they released the 62MAS remake. So really, it's, it's very understandable they would remake this piece, and the way they've done so is truly remarkable, with beautiful attention to detail. Where specifications are concerned, this piece is somewhere between normal standard production Seikos, and then the, uh, the ultra-exclusive models produced for, for example, the anniversary of the 6159. Because this piece does feature a high-grade movement, it uses the 8L35, which is the same movement as used in the Marine Master range, and, uh, and so is a, a 4Hz movement, not 5Hz, so not high beat, but still a higher beat than normal Seiko movements, with a 50-hour power reserve, automatic winding, and of course, old Grand Seiko architecture, making it a, a thoroughly enjoyable movement to use. Also, the general design of the case has changed somewhat, with a 200 meter water resistance up from the original's 150, and also one has a slightly wider case at, at uh, 45 mm in diameter from the original 44, but the feeling of this watch is very similar. Also, of course, it uses a, a sapphire crystal on the front, which is domed to mimic the original, um, the original version, which was mineral crystal, and the rubber strap resembles the original very closely. The crown is also redesigned to be screw down rather than locking, as was the case with the original, and one also has a much finer detail on the, the dial, with of course a matte black surface to the dial, but also exquisitely sharp hands, and that wonderful style of traffic light second hand which is, is so characteristic. The bezel is also much more similar to the last generation of Marine Master than to the original, in the sense that it has a guarded style of, uh, of luminous plot at the 12 o'clock position which is underneath a small crystal, as well as the main surface of the bezel, which is steel, which has been polished with their Zeratsu technique to create this incredibly fine polish, and then of course has been lacquered in this, this black colour. And this gives a wonderful appearance, though of course it's quite, uh, quite prone to scratching. But I think as a general item, a collector's item, and a piece for someone who is just an aficionado of old Seiko, this is a gorgeous piece, and a really very faithful remake, with even the case back resembling the original. And it's limited to 2,500 pieces, running at 450,000 yen, which is 4,250 US dollars, or around 3,800 pounds. Perhaps even more interestingly than that re-edition Seiko, is this new range of Prospect LX watches. And this is a range of three different styles of watch, produced to be the, the higher end of Seiko's own sports watch segment. And so these watches are titanium watches, with various watch resistances, and various applications from land to sea to air, depending upon the version. And so these watches all share the style of a 44.8mm titanium case, in this style which is reminiscent of the, the Marine Master, with those, those polished areas as well as those brushed areas, giving a very complex aesthetic. 
However, all of these cases have a super hard coating to them to resist scratching and, and to make them last longer with that wonderful luster of that Zeratsu polishing technique. Also, they all share this three-link style of oyster bracelet, which, uh, which is a bit more angular than an oyster but can be described in such terms, with various different clasps depending upon the version. And they also have different applications um, where the, the movement is concerned, with two versions, the land and the air version, having a GMT function, courtesy of the caliber 5R66, whilst the diving version, which is the most expensive, has the, the 5R65, which doesn't have that GMT function. And these movements are fantastically accurate spring drive movements from Seiko, and they don't come in the 9R range of spring drive movements, which are seen to only in Grand Seiko, but rather these movements still offer a great deal and offer incredible accuracy, being regulated to only plus one, minus one seconds a day, which is half the deviation of a Rolex, which I think is remarkable, and does show the, the real care that Seiko are using spring drive with to be able to, to offer greater functionality. Of course, they also have a 72-hour power reserve and are automatic, with the, the various um, uh, uses um, and the applications of having a power reserve indicator on the dial. The least expensive version in this range is the land version, and this model, like the other versions in the range, comes in a blacked out variant or a, uh, a simple uh, metal coloured version with coloration on the dial. And these pieces all have black dials, except the, uh, the version which isn't all blacked out has this, this yellow GMT hand, which is this very modern, almost bird beak shaped, with yellow graduations around the edge of the dial. This is all under a sapphire crystal as well, and one has a 200 meter water resistance thanks to a very large crown at 4 o'clock. The power reserve indicator on the dial is, is delicately done, attractively done I think, with the date framed at 3. And the general design of the dial is a little bit too fr fussy for my liking, but will be very functional for those who want to use this watch for its true purpose. Then the bezel of this watch is extremely complicated um, in terms of its, uh, its layers and levels, but is beautifully executed in titanium to match the case. Also, each bezel is unique in this range, with, uh, with each version having very different grips, so one sees that on the land version the grips are a sort of medium size, and should be very easy to, to take hold of. And of course one also has a luminous plot at 12 o'clock. Moving up to the sky version of this watch, and going up 500 euros to 5,600, one has a watch which retains the same sizing as the, 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 uh, the land version, but appears much more wearable with more formal attire because it has much more subdued colours, rather than that bright bright yellow, it has a sort of a more, more faded red, which is going to be, uh, be much more wearable with other colours, whilst it also has this bicolour ceramic bezel insert with the 24-hour graduations, and of course this is a bidirectional bezel. The knurlings are also much finer on this bezel to, to give it, a uh, again, a slightly more subdued appearance, and the dial is a, a much more delicate affair, because the dial comes either in sunburst blue with a white date, or simple black, with a black date on the version which is fully blacked out. Then it also has a sliding adjustment on the bracelet, um, as is the case in fact with the, the C version, but isn't seen on the land version, just to add additional functionality to a watch which uh, you'll be wearing in, uh, in di a different environment. The water resistance is also dropped to 100 meters from 200 meters with a smaller crown. Now the C version increases the water resistance to 300 meters with a very large crown placed at 4 o'clock, and a traditional diver's bezel with much larger grips than seen on either of the other versions, and a ceramic bezel insert. The dial is also much more standard marine master material with a matte black base, very large luminous indices, and these fantastically finished hands with brushing down the centre and polishing down the edge to give a very elegant look. And I think this is going to be the most popular of the three because it is just a more approachable and I think more refined aesthetic which is much more in line with Seiko itself rather than looking a little bit derivative, as is the case with the other two versions. Of course, this piece is somewhat thicker at 15.7mm thick, but you still get the very high accuracy movement, albeit without the GMT function. And I do find this design more appealing, um, and certainly the fact this watch also has sliding adjustment on the bracelet means it should be a very, very useful, very wearable style of, of dive watch for those who need it for its, its original purpose. And this piece does have a, uh, a price which is higher than the other two at €6,100, but I think this rounds out the range of an interesting line of new Seikos to provide that sort of technical side to the brand which previously was, was uh, filled out and filled in by the Thousand Meter Marine Masters. Now this penultimate piece is a model which wasn't actually released at Basel World. Instead it was released just a couple of days beforehand by Panerai. And the reason why I think it should be included in this video is because I feel that it's being compared to the, the releases at Baselworld because it was released so, um, uh, so closely to the show, so really it should be included in this video as a, a watch released at the same time. And this is the PAM00968, and it's a, a standard production bronze model for the, the, uh, the submersible line. 
And this is something which one hasn't been able to say before, because previously, and indeed as is shown by their current resale prices, Bronze Panerais have been limited editions and ex have been extremely collectible after their release. And this piece, which comes in at 47mm in bronze, with the, the submersible bezel and, uh, and dial design, is a standard production piece, and so will be accessible um, for an indefinite amount of time. And bronze has always made sense for Panerai as a design choice, because of course Panerai is very much rooted in the 1930s, 40s and 50s, and so the bronze with its patina, which develops quite quickly and gives a, uh, a resistant coating to the, the case, allows the watch to take on a much more vintage style than a steel case would, and so helps these watches to, to also be more of a statement model on the wrist, because of course at 47mm there's very little one can do to a case to make it more visible than turned into bronze, because even gold appears uh, perhaps a bit too gaudy for Panerai, at least they do make, make uh, golden versions, but I feel that bronze fits the style much better, with a, a sort of a, uh, a bright colour but with a hint of seaweed to it, if you will. And to match the style of this case, one has a brown ceramic bezel insert with the normal Panerai arrangement of having those, those studs in metal poking through it, in addition to a brown dial as well, with sunken seconds at 9 and the date at 3. And the design is very simple, without even having graduations for the minutes around the dial, but simply every 5 minutes in this, this aged Luminova, which also matches the pip at 12 o'clock on the bezel. And of course one also has the, uh, the use of small seconds, but loomed small seconds, to give a, um, a less cluttered centre to the dial, with that polished cap on the centre of the hands. One even has an aged and matching style of, of date wheel, which goes around the, the dial and, and I think fits very well with the design. And the dial also shows the fact that this watch is water resistant to 300 metres, giving it uh, the real diving credentials you would expect from Panerai. And bronze really has extended all through the, the build and design of this watch, with the mid case, the bezel and even the crown guard in that proprietary style being made from this material. The only part of this case which isn't made from bronze is the case back, which whilst also having a large sapphire window to be able to see the movement, is made from titanium for the sake of not reacting with sweat, and thus preventing any kind of unsightly marks or irritation to the skin which would occur with a bronze case back. And whereas the uh, the other bronze watch of note which was released at Basel World was the, the Tudor Black Bay, which has a new, new dial for the bronze variant, which I didn't include in this video because I think it's too minor a change to warrant speaking about, is very much a, a reinvention of what uh, was already existing in the range. This piece represents a, a very new presence of a bronze piece permanently in the Panerai range. But the choice of movement is very reasonable, and it's the calibre P99010, and this is a 72 hour power reserve in house movement, running at 4 hertz with 31 joules. It has details such as a balance bridge and, and also these very delicate brushed surfaces, and I think is a thoroughly good looking movement to see through the exhibition case back. And so the price of this watch is 16,500 US dollars. Now, the final piece I'd like to speak about comes in the form of a brand new range from Breitling. And the Breitling Super Ocean was becoming somewhat dated in its design, and I think was very much in need of a refresh. And the eye has very much been uh, been held by the Super Ocean heritage in recent years, with a much more more dressy sort of appearance and design, which is much more casual um, in terms of its its diving credentials than the standard Super Ocean with its high water resistance. And so they've updated the Super Ocean this year with a very wide range of new pieces in a variety of different dial colours and with a really fantastic design, which is very brightling, but also certainly um, doesn't uh, doesn't appear dated or in any way sort of anti antiquated. And these watches don't have the, the caliber which is seen in the Super Ocean Heritage, which is based on the Tudor MT5612 with its 70 hour power reserve and balance bridge, which I think is a shame. And certainly I think it does point to the fact that I feel that these watches are a bit overpriced for the movement they're offering, bearing in mind that all it's had done to it is being chronometer certified, which you can get for a fair bit less from a brand like Zodiac. However, I do still think this is an interesting range of watches with a design which is quintessentially brightling and is very attractive in a variety of different dial colours and with a slightly 70s tone to these watches without being overtly vintage, which I think is very, very well judged. Now, most of the range has a very similar shared design with this, this blocky design to the case, large crown guards and a bezel which is unidirectional and also has this deeply engraved steel insert. So one has this, um, this lower section of the bezel which is painted, and then these raised sections in brushed steel which protrude from the surface of it to give this fantastic three-dimensional effect, which I think looks great. Now the most affordable version of this watch comes in at 36mm by 11.24mm thick with a 200m water resistance and a light blue or white dial. And so this with its, uh, its, its polished and, and brushed steel case is certainly a piece which is aimed at the, the female market, although I must admit I think it would look good on a man's wrist as well and the price for this is €3,250. The version which I imagine will be most popular is the 42mm version, which is 13.32mm thick. 
and this piece has a 500 meter water resistance, up from the 200 meters of the 36 millimeter version, and has the same starting price. Its design is also very similar in stainless steel, and there are different colorways with this version, with black, orange, or indeed a white dial with blue accents on the bezel as well as the hands. And I think amongst these three, the, the, the white version is perhaps the most striking, but this really, I imagine, will be the most popular version due to its size and high water resistance. Doubling the water resistance to 1000 meters, one finds the 44 millimeter version, which is 14.21 millimeters thick, in this very similar stainless steel case, this time with just a black or a blue dial available with matching bezels. And these pieces come in at 100 euros more than the other two versions, at 3350 plus, depending upon whether you want the bracelet or not. The model with the highest water resistance is the 2000 meter water resistant 46 millimeter model, which is 16.85 millimeters thick. And this piece comes in a, a grey DLC case, which has this brushed finish as well. It also has a two dial variants with a blue dial and a black dial, but they have these, these blacked out bezels on these versions. And the grey DLC coating to these cases gives a much more tactical aesthetic than the other versions. Also, this watch is a, a piece which does cost a significant amount more at 4,350 plus um, euros, depending upon whether you want the strap or, uh, or other versions. But certainly this does make the, the most um, sizeable model in the range, apart from one oddity at the very top of the range at 48mm. Now the 48mm version is, is a very hefty 17.25mm thick, and it only has a 300m water resistance despite this size. However, the size is used for, for other functionality, and so it has a brushed DLC titanium case and no date, although I can assume the reason for no date is in order to be able to not have the date in the middle of the dial due to the sheer size of the case in relation to the movement. Then the watch also has uh, blue elements on the ceramic bezel, as well as on that locking section on the opposite side of the case to the crown, which is also blue. And this locking, locking uh, sort of uh, feature means that you can turn the bezel bidirectionally and then lock it in place. And this is, uh, is useful for being able to move the bezel more quickly, and also more easily if you're wearing gloves, for example, as some professional divers do. And so this rather immense titanium version doesn't yet have a price. And so I'll conclude this video here. But do tell me in the comments down below what you thought of this video, and indeed the pieces released this year at Baselworld. Because the general feeling I've got of the show is the fact that the Swatch Group wasn't there has allowed a lot more of the, the watches which one otherwise wouldn't have spoken about too much to be highlighted, which I think is very important, because there have been some very interesting releases which really offer a great deal to the industry, which I think with a, a great array of other pieces being released would have unfortunately not been, uh, been spoken about enough. And so if you enjoyed the video, then do please like, share and subscribe to help the channel, and also to be able to see more videos and content here in future. So thank you very much for watching, this is Arm on the Watch Guy, out.